Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm, a I'm, I'm sensitive to the time because uh, we want to leave as much time as possible for the questions. So if I start to accelerate uh, the talking, that's, that's what uh, I'm, I'm trying to accomplish is get through it. So let me say a little bit about uh, Highwire Press. We're a not-for-profit division of Stanford University. We just celebrated our 18th anniversary. Uh, we, we provide a publishing platform for scholarly communications, journals, books, and uh, meeting proceedings and so other society uh, materials. So the, what I wanted to start with is uh, to pose a question. So Outsell, in a recent report, uh, is calling on publishers to clean up their metadata. And they're basically saying that they must invest in making metadata clean enough to present to the public looking for new insights from their data. So as a publisher, how does your investment in metadata curation translate into increased discovery of your content? That's a single question I'm going to try to answer. Uh, and I'll try to do it quickly. So how is it that some Google search results have additional tidbits of useful information in the result listing and others don't? How does it know what data to pull out of the HTML document it just crawled? Note the ratings elements in, in this slide. So the, this is the uh, internet movie database rating and uh, in the search result, and the rating has been pulled out of the database record and, and brought to the user. How does Google know how to do that? IMDB is not a Google product. They don't have access to the IMDB database. So uh, how is that happening? And how does Google Scholar know how to collapse 18 versions of the same article? That first article has 18 versions found on the web. And if you did the search in Google, Google Web, you would find tons of links all to the same article. How does Google Scholar know how to collapse all 18 versions of the same article into a single entry in the search result? Furthermore, it offers a site widget which formats citation data in MLA, APA, and Chicago styles. Where does it get the data to offer that kind of a feature? Google author profiles collect all the papers authored by an individual without benefit of the authors themselves manually making such associations. It lists co-authors, publication, metadata, and even references. How is this done? While we don't have all the inputs to the various Google algorithms, we do have some idea of how these are accomplished via copious amounts of high-quality metadata. To understand the mechanics of this, let's take a brief look at what a user sees at a Highwire website. Here we are at a recent eLife article displaying the usual article metadata, title, authors, DOI, abstract. Note the additional categories and tags in the right hand well as a reader aid for scanning and browsing. If we include the abstract in the metadata category, and at Highwire we do, then virtually this entire page is just a well formatted metadata record. Each keyword button on the right hand side is a search for that semantic. So if I click on that uh, Trip M5 button, I'll get a search result consisting of all the articles published in eLife with that keyword assigned. Unfortunately, there aren't any. But hold that thought. We'll come back to that. What does Google or Google Scholar see when they read this page? Now, look away. This might be scary. <laughs> this particular article has 122 separate meta elements conveying the article metadata. I'm showing some of the Dublin Core specified tags here. Some metadata are repeated using different vocabularies. For example, the open graph or Facebook values for title, URL, site name, publication date, and so forth. They're used in social network uh, applications like Pinterest and Google Plus and Facebook to understand w what content is on that page uh, when it's brought into the social network. Note that roughly half of the above, uh, well, you can't see it because I didn't show you all 122, but I'll tell you that half of the above are citation references. That last entry is a citation reference. This means eLife is publishing all of the cited reference is in every article. The reason they do that is so that every one of those references is an opportunity to bring traffic back to that article that cited the reference. Google, Google Scholar refers to these tags as the Highwire tag set, and they encourage other scholarly publishers to also produce such metadata on their web pages. So what other serendipitous use of, the, of these data could be made? The bar is extremely low for new applications based on these publicly available semantics. Note that the keywords from the previous screen are, the ver are, the, are right at the top of the metadata feed. We'll come back to that. Another journal article, also with lots of head elements. But wait, there's, there's more to this article. In addition to the metadata in the head, we want to move some of the metadata into the body. 
together with the narrative form to form tightly coupled descriptive blocks that allow deeper understanding of the data. This is a wonderfully slippery slope as we get better at applying the natural language processing that uh, Guillaume was uh, referring to and text mining to perform entity extraction, the metadata slowly morph into just data described via evolving vocabularies of item types and item properties. From the schema.org website, uh, we can find collections of shared vocabularies that webmasters can use to mark up their pages in ways that can be understood by the major search engines. This is the valuable SEO uh, technique. And why do we do this? Remember that ratings example in the second slide? Here's the page that Google crawled. It has 20, uh, it, so I'll just say, of course, I didn't show you the whole page because I didn't want people to faint dead away from looking at that much HTML, but this is the relevant portion that brings the rating out of that HTML page from the IMDB site and lets Google understand that it has, there's a rating value, it knows what the best rating is, it knows how many uh, counts, et cetera. These are all metadata that are marked up in the schema.org uh, tag set and all the major crawlers make use of these. In addition to feeding search inde indexers and social web networks, the same metadata can easily be reused in pre-built feeds available on the site or at feed aggregator sites, as well as dynamic feeds based on content APIs. The uses of such feeds by the publisher are multiple. They can build widgets, entirely new sites like publisher portals or marketing sites, even as ways to ingest the metadata injected by the file conversion or content ingestion phase. So if you're running your content through a platform that then is running Temis to understand what's in the data and then they add that to the metadata, you might want to, as a publisher, then pull all of that back out, back into your metadata database uh, to an understand what your holdings are. Uh, note the use in this case of FeedBurner to deliver the RSS feed and also to track the link back. This gives publishers a way to understand how their RSS feeds are being used. While incredibly useful and essential to SEO and discovery programs, these approaches are not the complete answer in that the metadata can only really be understood in the context of the container. Meta tags are part of HTML page. Schema.org microdata are also part of an HTML page. And while the RSS feed does live outside of the site that is served, it's often just another list of items found at that site. That is, it doesn't link out the resources found at other sites. Depositing metadata at a &I services, for example, Crossref, PubMed, helps address the first two deficiencies and gets a little further down the road of linking things via article references. But the metadata are then just encapsulated anew in a set of pages or feeds hosted by industry-specific services. The rest of the web is excluded from that. What we'd like is a solution that conveys all of the facts contained in the document, separated from the page or the container itself, downloadable, queryable, reusable, in a web standard way without reliance on intermediary services. The question is, does such a service exist? Uh, yes, and that's the linked open data. It's the foundation of the semantic web. Well, that's a pretty picture. It's, it's got a lot of pieces, but how does it work? How does this, how does this solve the problem? How does your metadata inc increase discoverability using linked open data? Let's say you're reading that article on TRIPM5 and, and, the, and back in that eLife publication and you would like more information on that protein. In addition to the search aid to find more content within the site, perhaps a mouse over widget that returns information from a trusted source like Wikipedia or NCBI's Entrees databases. The Wikipedia page for TRIPM5 contains descriptions of the protein as well as useful links to other resources on the web about TRIPM5, but this page is another data silo. Do I just have to scrape and parse that in order to find the links to the information that I want? No. Linked data refers to an information architecture implemented on the web using published web standards that allow for direct linking between data inside of HTML documents. The open of linked open data refers to those data being shared as opposed to locked behind a paywall. Publishers curated metadata with controlled vocabularies together with mind entities using semantic technologies like Temis are the low-hanging fruit in the effort to link up scholarly communications to and from the web at large. Thank you. <laughs>